So why do microbes not care about borders? I recently visited my local fountain to find out what kind of uh, microbes, microorganisms live in it. And uh, when I looked uh, at the water under the microscope, I discovered that many of the organisms that are found there are also common in ponds and in streams. And uh, for me, this uh, raised the interesting question, uh, how did they get there in the first place? So in other words, uh, how do microscopic organisms manage to spread between different uh, environments? So hi, hello and welcome again, uh, Microbe Hunter here, I'm Oliver, and uh, I like uh, to explore the microscopic world uh, together with you. And uh, today in this video, I want to take a closer look at how microscopic organisms travel from place to place. How do they end up in fountains, in ponds, and even in isolated water bodies far from each other? Now, the idea that they've always been there, it doesn't really hold, hold up very much because the fountain is only has been around for a few hundred years. Before it was built, I mean, it didn't exist, so neither did the microbial community that we find there today. Now, uh, even centuries ago, people noticed uh, something similar. So if you leave a boiled soup, uh, for example, and uh, which uh, starts uh, free of microbes because it was just boiled, if you leave the boiled soup sitting out for a few days, then soon it fills uh, with life again, bacteria starting to grow in it, fungi and, and more. And uh, you definitely don't want to eat that, of course. Uh, but back then, um, some people believed uh, in the concept of so-called spontaneous generation. That is the idea that life could arise from its own, uh, from non-living material, uh, such as uh, the boiled soup. Now, today we know that this is not true. Life uh, can only come from life and microorganisms, they don't just appear. Well, they have to come from somewhere and uh, then when they settle down, they start to reproduce. Now, scientists like Louis Pasteur and Rudolf Virchow, they helped uh, to solve this. Now, um, in fact, um, you don't even need a pond or a fountain because the same thing happens if you, for example, leave a jar of water standing up open. Um, over time, uh, it fills with uh, microorganisms. So, for example, this plastic bottle on my desk here, for example, now has a whole visible biofilm of algae and bacteria growing in it. Now, in the case of the fountain, there are several ways of how microbes uh, could have arrived. Of course, wind, rain, insects, birds, and even larger animals can carry them. The fountain isn't a closed system. Um, it is constantly interacting with its surroundings. A bird might have uh, come from a pond and then landed on the fountain, bringing microorganisms uh, on its feathers or on its feet. If the conditions are right, these microbes will settle down and they will start to multiply. Well, of course, not all of them survive. Uh, some may dry out and die during the journey. Others might not be able to cope with the new environment. Maybe the water temperature, the oxygen levels or the mineral content isn't suitable. Maybe there is also too little light, uh, which uh, matters especially for photosynthetic uh, organisms. Now, still, if conditions are right, microbes grow and uh, if not, they die or at least they don't start to reproduce. They don't recognize human-made boundaries. They spread freely and they're carried uh, by natural forces. And uh, when the environment dries out, like for example during a drought or even after cleaning a certain surface, then many of the microbes die, but the cycle starts again. Within days or weeks, new microbial ecosystems uh, start to appear. And that's why you rarely see microbes in fresh puddles of rain, because it simply takes some time for them to arrive and to establish themselves. Now this uh, kind of uh, microbial spread is natural, but some larger organisms also travel across borders and uh, they can cause uh, serious problems. So for example, take the quagga mussel. Um, in recent years, it has spread between lakes, including here in Austria. Local authorities therefore have banned stand-up paddle boats in some alpine lakes because the mussel can attach themselves to the boards and uh, be transported from one lake uh, to the other. It reproduces quickly, uh, so the sharp shells can also injure people, but more importantly, it can severely disrupt uh, the ecosystem. And uh, while it's not a microorganism, the same principle applies. Um, it travels, uh, in this case, uh, also by the help of humans. It settles down, and if the conditions are right, um, it will start uh, to reproduce. 
Now let's uh, go back uh, to the fountain. I have to admit that I was a little bit disappointed when I returned recently because someone had cleaned it and uh, most of the algae are, were gone. Um, so it used to be completely overgrown with moss and with biofilm and algae, but now it looks kind of, well, I think a little bit too clean for my taste. Still, I'm glad that I was able to find a sample and I'm now excited to, of course, share it with you. Um, and yes, uh, this uh, is only a matter of time um, until the algae and the moss, they start to come back. Um, because if there is one thing that uh, I've learned uh, over the years, and then it's the so-called, that even the simple life forms, the so-called the simple life forms, well, they are often the hardest uh, ones uh, to get rid of. Yeah, I think uh, this is all that I wanted to, to share with you today. Microorganisms are able to travel more or less freely and without borders. Therefore, they are able to settle down in many different places. Yeah, I think microbes are fascinating. And with that, uh, I would like to wish you all the best. Happy microbe hunting as always. Hope to see you in the next video. Bye-bye.